here are some common mistakes. So what we're gonna do is talk about these very, very briefly. Then I will pretend to be a student who is doing one of these common mistakes. In the comments, what I want you to tell me is, which of these am I doing, all right? So robotic delivery, so speaking like a robot, memorized answers, and giving a memorized answer instead of just a normal answer, trying to impress the examiners, so think about the things that people try and do to impress the examiners, way too long and way too short, okay? So think about these, it might be multiple ones, um, or it might just be one, but let's start with the first question. My favorite website is IELTS Advantage because it helps me with my IELTS scores. So that's the first one. Uh, what do you think would be the problem with that one? Which of these things do you think is the problem? In the comments, let me know. Pretty obvious, it's too short. But why is that a problem? So, I mean, the grammar was fine, the vocabulary was fine, the fluency was fine, pronunciation was fine. Why is that a problem? Well, you're not really giving the examiner enough to go on if you give a really, really, really short answer to a question. And they're going to be, they might ask you follow-up questions like why, or can you, you know, asking you to develop your answer a little bit more. That might put you off. It might be like, oh, is, am, I, am I doing something wrong? It'll cause extra stress. You want to be developing your answer a little bit more than that. Now, for part one, you don't have to develop it much more than that, but just giving one, a one-sentence answer wouldn't really be enough. My favorite kind of weather is cold weather because I do not like to be cold. When I am cold, I feel bad and I shiver because it is very cold. I always like warm weather. Warm weather is nice. That's why I like the summertime. So in the comments, what do you think about that one? Was it a memorized answer, trying to impress the examiner, too long, too short, robotic delivery? What do you think? Have a look again in the comments. And do we chance is robotic delivery? Yeah, so, I mean, this is not really a student's fault. It can be a couple of things. Number one, it can be because you're really stressed out. Um, it is a very stressful exam. Obviously, you, you, know, you might have a lot of pressure in terms of it might cost you your job, it might lead to your family being you know, upset with you, you might have a visa waiting for you. It is a very, very high stakes test. What happens is people just you know, kind of clam up and speak in a very, very robotic way. So that is a problem because you're not being as fluent as you could be. Also, if you are so stressed out that you are speaking in that way, then people tend to make, in my experience, more grammar and uh, vocabulary mistakes because they're just not relaxed and speaking in a natural way. So there's lots and lots of problems you can have there. The other reason is a lot of people have been taught that the IELTS speaking test is a formal academic test and you should speak in a formal academic way. It's not. It's a speaking test about how you would speak to a normal person in a normal situation. One of the key pieces of advice is just speak to the examiner in the same way that you would speak to a friend or a colleague or a classmate or a teacher, someone who you know when you're not speaking in a really, really informal or formal way, just in a, in a normal way would be good. So you could say that I'm a real fashionista and I wouldn't really dress down once in a blue moon because I am a real fashionaholic and fashion is my life. I would die for fashion. So when I'm in the mood, I go to the shopping center with my buddies and we buy the place out and we spend lots of money buying new clothes. So in the comments, what would you say is the problem there? To thank you for watching this video, I wanna give you a free course that has helped thousands of students improve their IELTS speaking score. What it's gonna do is take you through every single part of the test and give you strategies for part one, part two, and part three, and also allow you to practice at home for free and get feedback. To sign up for that for free, all you have to do is just click the link in the description. Thanks very much, and let's get back to the video. Memorizing, no. Robin said trying to impress, yeah. So that person is trying to impress the examiner and what they're doing is they're just thinking of as many big words and idioms and uh, you know fancy vocabulary as they can. They, they are not answering the question. They're not thinking about answering the question. They're approaching the test as if it is 
a vocabulary test. You can also try and impress the examiner with fancy grammar structures and things like that, but that person was principally thinking that the test wasn't a speaking test, it was a vocabulary test, and ignoring these things. All right, so when you're doing that, when you're focusing just on vocabulary, then you're not really focusing on being coherent and answering the question. So there's a relationship between these two. You should worry about these, and you shouldn't worry about one more than the other. If you are just focusing on grammar and being 100% accurate all the time, then your fluency tends to go down, all right? Because you, you can't think of the perfect grammar every single sentence and hope to have really, really good fluency. Same with your vocabulary. If you're just focusing on vocabulary, then your fluency and your coherence tend to be affected. So there is a relationship between these two. Remember, it's a speaking test, and these are components of speaking. It's not just a pronunciation test, or just a vocabulary test, or just a grammar test, or just a fluency test. So we've talked about robotic delivery. We've talked about trying to impress the examiner. We've talked about being too short. Memorized answers. This is when, obviously, you memorize an answer. And this really trips people up. Because what you'll do is you'll memorize an answer for a common question, like, tell me about your hometown, or describe your home, or you know, one of these, like, what is your job? Do you, what do you like to do in your free time? So they'll memorize that answer, and they'll give a ve normally a very, 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 very long answer to a question. And I'm sure you've heard people do this. What that means is two things. Normally, that will affect your coherence because you're not really answering the question. A really good example was I was working with a student and I, I asked them, is your hometown a good place to grow up? And they told me about the architecture in their hometown, the transport system in their hometown, their, what else did they talk about? Uh, education system, like telling me everything about their hometown. And I said to them, you just memorized an answer and you've, about your hometown and you've given me that. So that obviously affected their, their coherence. What will also happen when you memorize an answer is, the examiner will not think, oh my God, this person is amazing. The examiner will think, this person has memorized an answer, I'm pretty sure. Let's ask them a more difficult question or a question on a different topic or a follow-up question and see how they cope with that. They'll ask you a different question and what people who memorize answers normally do is like, uh, mm, uh, 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 I don't know how to answer that because it's not a because I haven't memorized an answer. So you're not fooling the examiner. They're trained in these things. They know what you're doing. They do it for a, for a job. Um, could someone come into your job and try and trick you on something as silly as that? Hopefully not. So why do you think the examiners would fall for that? So you've just demonstrated that you, you can't speak English. Here's these common mistakes, and let's look now at best practices. So thank you for making it this far in the video. I want to give you 10% off our VIP course. The IELTS VIP course is the most successful IELTS course in the world. That is a fact because we have more band seven, eight, and nine success stories than any other IELTS course in the entire world. We do that by simplifying the whole IELTS process, supporting you with some of the best IELTS teachers in the world, and being with you every step of the way until you get the score that you need. All you have to do is just look down in the description, just click that, and you can sign up. If you have any questions about the VIP course, always feel free to get in touch with us. We answer 100% of the questions that we get. Hope that you have become a VIP. If not, enjoy the rest of this free video. So I'm not gonna give you the best practices. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to pretend that I am a student in the test, all right? And I'm gonna answer them as best I can. And then we're gonna come up as a group in the comments, you're gonna tell me some of the things that you think I did right. Remember, we're gonna be basing everything on these. Pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary, fluency, and coherence. And compare them also with the, the bad examples that we showed you here. I would have to say, hands down, my favorite food is steak. So my wife cooks this for me every Friday. Normally, I go for a workout and been lifting weights and running around, and I'm really, really hungry. So what I uh, get is steak with chips, mushrooms, and onions, and I just feel fantastic after I have that, and normally I have a little glass of red wine to go along with that as well. In the comments, tell me some of the things that you think I did well, 
And so how could we create some best practices? By the way, that wasn't a perfect answer or an answer that you should copy or an answer that, you know, that's the only way to answer that. What's your favorite food? There are a million ways that you could answer that that could get you a band nine. The content wasn't important. What we're trying to get are these best practices, the things that you can learn from so that you can not copy that answer, but model it and, and learn from it. So a lot of you are saying that the answer was too long. A lot of people learn from teachers and from online resources is that you should use a set number of sentences. That like you should say three sentences or you should say a set number of words. Like it should be 50 words long. That is not how you should think about it. You should think about the answer as how can I answer this question naturally? How, if somebody asked me this question under normal circumstances, how would I answer it? Don't be thinking of number of sentences or anything like that. I love to watch US crime dramas. So there's a few of those that I've really become addicted to in the past, uh, principally Sopranos, The Wire, and Breaking Bad. So these are uh, all very, very long series. Um, and what I like about them is they're very episodic so that you can just go from episode to episode to episode. Um, and it's try and watch like one or two a night, but sometimes it goes a little bit over that because they are very, very addictive. From that, what would you say are the good things that you could use to model as well? Someone said the idea generation was good. I wouldn't really say idea generation for the speaking test so much because remember part one is about you. You can't get it wrong. So you're not thinking of an idea like making something up really. What you're doing is just talking honestly about what you're like, that was my favorite food. That were, those were the, the, my favorite TV programs. And those are much, much easier to talk about than to make something up, like to generate ideas. Sometimes you'll have to do that, um, but most of the time it's better just to speak naturally. A little pause for thinking. Yeah, so, <laughs> Fluency does not mean speaking without pausing ever. You do need to think, all right? Um, it is better to think for a couple of seconds and then give your answer than to immediately begin talking and then get lost and, you know, start, uh, 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 uh. So I don't think it's, you know, mandatory for you to think at the beginning. I don't think that that's a best practice. Um, but I think the point I'm trying to make is Fluency does not mean that you never pause. You, you, it's a bad fluency is when you're pausing at an unnatural rate. Examples, grammar, I'm fluent, okay. Okay, so I'll give one more example and then we can talk about what I did. I use too many apps, I use hundreds of apps. Actually recently what I've been trying to do is to make my phone a lot healthier uh, for, I'm more, to make me more productive. So what I mean by that is in the past, I had a lot of social media apps such as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and that wasted a huge amount of time. So I deleted all of those from my phone. And now I use apps that can track my uh, number of steps that I'm taking, my sleep, um, general exercise, calorie intake, things like that. And um, so that will help me improve in the future rather than just waste time with apps that don't really improve my life at all. Again, what do you think about that one? So all of them, all of them have some, some common themes, all right? And that's what you wanna do. You don't wanna be copying the content or thinking this is exactly what he said or this is exactly what he did. Just think about the common themes amongst them. So um, definitely a lot of you talked about that they were natural and, and yes, these are about me. There are questions that are asking about me. They're, when you are in the test, they're asking about you. So just ask them naturally or answer them naturally. That is going to help your fluency, but I also think it helps your grammar, your pronunciation and your vocabulary as well because you're not thinking too much um, because it's just easier to talk about yourself and to talk naturally. So a lot of you talked about the questions are developed. I gave some explanations, some examples. Again, going back to this, an answering it naturally. I don't think it is a good idea to answer part one questions in a very formulaic way. What do I mean by that? What a lot of people will do is suggest that you um, like answer 
and then explanation and then example like that is a very very formulaic way of answering a question can that help you sure it can help you but do you answer questions in your native language in that way like imagine you're speaking to your brother or your sister or your friend tonight and they asked you what's your favorite tv program or what's your favorite food you wouldn't think like my favorite food is steak explain explain you know and then okay it's my favorite food because blah 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 example last week i you wouldn't really do that. Uh, does that mean that you should never use explanations and examples? No, but just have them as like tools in your toolkit. Coherence, so that's related to I developed the answer and I answered the specific question, all right? I'm a native English speaker, so I don't want to say my grammar was great or my vocabulary was great because I was you know, born speaking English. I didn't try and focus on using really, really impressive grammar, impressive vocabulary. What I did was just answer the questions naturally. And by doing that, the grammar and the vocabulary and the fluency just flowed from that. If your grammar and your vocabulary and your fluency is good enough and you just answer the questions naturally, these will take care of themselves. But if you go into, okay, he asked me about my favorite food. What's, what are some big adjectives I can think of? Or what are some idioms I can use? Then your fluency is going to suffer because you're thinking way too much. And you're probably going to make lots of grammar and vocabulary mistakes because you'll be thinking about grammar and vocabulary that's beyond your level that you're not able to use yet. So use the grammar and vocabulary that you are comfortable using to fluently develop your answer and then everything kind of looks after itself. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you need more help with not just your speaking preparation, but your writing, your listening, your reading, this is my email address. We answer 100% of the emails that we receive. So if you just need a little bit of help or you have a question or you want to work with us, let us know via email and we will be back in touch with you. Or if you just want to continue on your journey with us here on YouTube, this video should help you out.